Thank you, Emma, and the worship team for leading us this morning. If you're a guest with us today, you're just joining us, you're finding the church in the middle of a series. We're actually coming to the end of a series, Jesus and Genesis. Today is the finale of that series. There's a Bible in the chair back, or you can pull it up on your screen. Genesis chapter 11 is where we will be today. And we'll enter into chapter 12. Genesis 12 might be one of the central, if, if you said, hey, what's the central passage of all the Bible? You'd probably go Romans 12, uh, Genesis 12. Hard to go anywhere without those two chapters. It's foundational to the gospel. Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 is where we will start. So follow along. I believe the text is on the screen as well. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah, in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka, and Iska. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. The rest of chapter 11. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. The, the context of where we are today, it doesn't look good. Now, just a, a reminder where we are in context of the whole Bible. This is before the Mosaic Law. This is before the Ten Commandments. This is before the Jewish people. Abraham's the father of the Jews, but he himself was not a Jew. He's the father of the Jews. So he's, he's an idolater at this point. But it doesn't look good when you, when you get to this place in early Genesis. It looks like it's game over. It's game over. So you have a family that the Messiah is going to come from. And you see that in the first few chapters. We've been kind of walking through that in Seth. And then it comes to Shem and his family. This is the family that the Messiah one day is going to come out of. So you would think this is the one family that's going to be following God. The remnants. Every, no one else is, but at least there's one family, right? There's some hope. When we come to this text, there's no more hope. It's game over. It's not going well. Mankind continues to fail. How, how do we know that? Because this is the family. Abram. And his father, his brothers, they knew of God. They knew of the one true God. They knew of the stories through oral tradition of what God had done, how he saved their ancestors on the ark. But now, where are they? They're worshiping idols. They're not where they're supposed to be. They started to go to where God had called them to go. And they went about halfway. Can anybody relate? Has anybody obeyed God halfway? We started on the journey, but this land looks pretty good. I'm sure God's going to credit me with something, right? We didn't go to where we were supposed to go, but we went to Ur, and it looked pretty good. So we just camped out here. They didn't go where they were called to go. When I was in high school... I, was, I had the opportunity to go on a missions trip. It was through an organization called Teen Missions. And it wasn't a week long or two weeks. It was for 40 days. It was my entire summer. Go to boot camp in Merritt Island, Florida for two weeks. And then 2,000 teenagers are split into teams of 30 to go to different parts of the world. And I went to Greece. And one night, I might have shared this story already, after a pastor's been out of church for a certain time, we gotta, i got to keep track of the stories I've told. So I, bear with me if I've always shared my call. 
to ministry. It's the middle of the night. I was sleeping in a tent. Rocks. The tent was laying on rocks, so I didn't sleep real well. I got out in the middle of the night. Now I'm 16. Stars in the sky overlooking the Aegean Sea. And God called me to ministry. He said, your life will not have true fulfillment unless you serve me. That was, that was the call in the middle of the night. And I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know what this would look like and where I was going to go to school and what I, missionary or pastor. I didn't know any of that. I just knew God had called me to vocational service. I get home. I stay involved in the youth group in the church about halfway. And then I graduate, and rather than going to Bible school, pursuing what God's called me to do, I got comfortable, and I said, I, I'd rather go into business. And, you know, then I can make some money, and then God can use me later on in life. So I start justifying. Well, I don't think. Maybe he wanted me to do this. If God's called you to business, thank you. You are needed in the industry that God's called you to. But I put it off. I went about halfway. And I realized after two years, I was doing retail at the time, paying my way through business school. And I realized God called me again. So I haven't forgotten. It's time, time to go. And so I, back then, you didn't have computers to book tickets. So I called Southwest Airlines. I was in Kansas City at the time. I said, book me a flight to Midway in Chicago. My parents didn't even know about it. I got on a flight. I went to Chicago. I toured the school. I signed the paperwork. And my parents were like, where'd you go? I was 20, still living at home. When God's call gets a hold of you, every one of us in this room has been called by God. Every one of us. It begins. The first call is, is salvation. Salvation is it's, it's the call of God on your life to say, I'm calling you to a relationship with me. And your response and my response to that is faith. It's not work harder. It's, you don't earn it. How was Abraham saved? Abraham was saved by faith. He wasn't saved because of his family. He wasn't saved because his great-great-great-grandparents was Noah and his wife. Abraham, even though early in the passage of, of Genesis, we see blessings and curses. We see that. We see different family trees. And some of us today, we may have come from pretty good stock when it comes to faith. The call is to you as a person and as an individual. God does not care what your last name is when it comes to his call on your life. He's calling you to make an individual commitment. That's the first call. All of us in this room, God's calling you a personal saving relationship with Jesus. And our response to that is, is faith. Faith. And we're going we're gonna to look at that. Then there's, then there's specific calls God's going to give to, to Abraham. But I, I didn't want to overlook some of us, myself included. At times in life, the calls come upon my life. I'm like, how can I, how can I do the bare minimum here? How can I please God and please the world and please myself? It doesn't work out too well. Those two years that I was not doing what God had called me to do were pretty miserable. God's call overwhelmed me. My only response was to do what he was asking. As we grow in maturity and faith, to get to the point, friends, to say yes to God before he even asks, we sang some of those lyrics today. I say yes to you, wherever, wherever. Really? Really? Whatever, wherever, with whoever. Are you willing to say yes? God's call reaches each and every one of us in this room. So they are serving idols. That was commonplace. Abram at this time. Now the call, chapter 12. Look at the call, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Here it comes. Now the Lord said to Abram, go. Wasn't qualified. 
Abram didn't write up a resume. He didn't say, hey, I, I wasn't waiting for the call of God. Abram was an idolater. He didn't have all the credentials. God shows up and says, go. Go. That is, if, if we could sum up the mission to Boulder Mountain Church, why we're even here today. It's those two little letters. It's some of the final words that Jesus gave us. Go. Followers of Jesus I have found in my life move. We move a lot. Now, I'm not just talking physical moving. Sometimes that's the case. But followers of Jesus, we should be on the move. Literally, we're saying a follower of Jesus. That indicates a verb, to follow, to move. Where is Jesus going in your life? Are you following him? Famous saying, Jewish saying was, may I wear the dust of my rabbi? Meaning I'm following my rabbi so closely. I'm following Jesus so closely that where he steps, I step, and the dust from his sandals gets onto my sandals. Where's Jesus taking you? Where's he calling you to go? The call upon Abram, go from your country as much as possible. Put yourself in Abram's situation here. Go from your country and your kindred, the people that you know, your family, your friends. Sometimes friends or family, sometimes not. But your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Okay, so God, you're calling me. Pull out my map. Where are you calling me to go? He doesn't know. He doesn't know where he's going. Following God is saying yes before you even have the map. Following God means I don't, I don't know anything about any of this. Abram, he didn't know. All he knew was God said to go. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. Abram, your name means at this point in time, he's 75. We don't know anything about him for 75 years. We don't know the first 75. If you're 75 or above in the room, God's not done with you yet. 75 years, we don't know anything about him. Now things are starting. Now the call comes. You're like, I'm waiting for a call. Maybe you're not 75 yet. Call's coming. Go. He's 75. He's probably settling in thinking this is where he's going to retire. I don't know if they had snowbirds back then. This is Ur. That's where he is. He's camping out in Ur, setting up the tents. But now this is what God says. I will make your name great. You know what his name meant? Abram, exalted father. His entire life, he was called exalted father, and he never had a child. It's kind of odd, isn't it? His name meant exalted father. He had to live with the daily reminder that he wasn't a dad. He couldn't have kids. Sarah, the same. They were barren. There were seven barren women throughout Scripture. Barrenness. For some in the room, they've lived that and experienced that and the brokenness and the heartache, and that. that's so difficult. Throughout Scripture, we get the picture of barrenness. It's, it's the idea of it's hopeless. I cannot see life in the future once I'm gone. It's the end. And there's a spiritual illustration here. That unless God calls, it's over for all of us. Unless God calls, this is the end. Abram and, and Sarah, it's, it's the end. And God says, I will make your name great. Your name, exalted father. I will now make your name great. And what? I will give you a country. Give you a, a new land. I will keep reading. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. One translation this week said, I will mess with those who mess with you. I kind of, I, I like that. We all get that. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, if I'm Abraham, I'm like, I don't have any kids. How is this going to work out? Okay, now verse 4. How is Abraham saved 
through faith. How is any saint in the Old Testament prior to Jesus, how were they saved? Not through sacrifices. Not by doing good works. They were saved by faith. Faith leads to action. Verse 4. If you've got a colored pencil or a pen or so, Abram went. God, where, where, were you going to tell me where I'm going? No, just pack up. But, but where am I going? I'll tell you that later. Okay, I don't have any kids. So how am I going to, how is this going to work? You don't need to know that right now. Where's this land? And let me propose to you. Abram, soon to be Abraham father, exalted father, changed the name Abraham of multitudes. Of multitudes. He doesn't even get to meet his grandchildren. Right? The only land that he owns is his grave at the end of his life. He never got to see the promised land. Some of us today were living in the gap. The gap of we've received the promise and the call, but it hasn't been completely fulfilled yet. And you're like, what, what are you talking about? Has anybody taken a step of faith to follow God and ever, all your wildest dreams have not come true yet? Anybody relate? You're waiting. You've took a step and you're waiting. Abram can relate. Abraham can relate. He went not knowing where he was going. But he goes. Now, now count the cost. He left his kindred. He left his culture. He left his family. Some of us, when we say yes to the call of God, we say yes to follow Jesus, the whole family is not going to be excited about that. When we say yes to obeying God and what he's called you to do, not everyone's going to be excited about that. Expect that and, and plan on that. His economy, he was doing pretty well from everything we knew. He, he had animals, he had some land, and God says to leave it all behind. So he, he does, he counted the cost. What cost are you holding on to that you don't want to give up when it comes to the call of God on your life? What reasons, what excuses, what safety, what comfort are you saying, I would, but... I can't. This just feels too good here. You can stay where you are. You, you can stay where you are. You, you have salvation, right? But when it comes to the call of God in the rest of your life, you will not be a blessing to others unless you get up and move. Now, the title of today's message is Blessed for You. No. No. Blessed to be a blessing. Throughout Scripture, regardless of maybe what you've heard elsewhere, God does not bless you for you. I know sometimes we pray that. God, I want this for me because my life would be easier and better and I would love you more. I'd follow you more closely if you gave this to me. Has anybody prayed that prayer? The, the blessing to Abraham was not for Abraham. Abraham was not the end result of the blessing. He was blessed so that he could be a blessing. The blessing through him does not happen unless he gets up and goes. You will not be a blessing to others unless you receive that blessing and go. What's the call on your life? What's the comfort zone? Listen, growth does not happen in comfort zones. It's not until you experience some hardship and you go and you're wondering, where am I going? You, and there's challenges and it's difficult. The blessings will come through you, through you. I was practically speaking here. Was that if, if you're good at running business and God's blessed you in that area, what does it mean for you to be a blessing to others, maybe to your employees? If you have material possessions, it was not just so that you can go have fun on the lake with a boat. How could you use that boat to be a blessing to the others? You put my email up on the screen there. No, just, just kidding. Pastor joke. 
What do you have? What do you have that could be a blessing to someone else? Your gifts? What gifts, talents, skills do you have that God gave to you not for your own benefit, but so that you can be a blessing to someone else? What time do you have? You're like, I don't, I don't have much time. I only have an hour a week. I only have a couple hours a week. How can you leverage that time to be a blessing to other people? Are you serving? Are you using your gifts? What's the call of God when it comes to the spiritual gifts that you have? Jesus tells us a parable about that. Some of them dig a hole and dump the gifts in there and bury it. Where are your gifts today? Are they out in the yard buried? Or are they actively being used? And finally, your treasure. How are you using the finances that God's blessed you with? No matter how much you make, I believe every person on the planet can give something because it teaches contentment. When we take what God has so generously given to you, we take that and we give it. It teaches contentment. How are you using your time, your talents, and your treasure to be a blessing to others? What does that look like? It's so easy to make it all about me. It's so easy for my prayer life to become all about me. God, I, I, I need this and I want this. And boy, God, my life would be so much easier tomorrow if you did this, this, and this. It's so easy to not think about, God, what have you given to me? How have you blessed me? So I can be a blessing to others. You can stay comfortable. You can stay safe, but you won't be a blessing to others. Do you want to be a blessing to others? You and I are here today partly because Abraham went. Abraham went. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his his wife and Lot, his brother's son, and all the possessions that they had gathered. And the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to the land of Canaan, and Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreb. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give the land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Again, he's saying, I'm, you have offspring that are coming. He hasn't had any children at this point. What in your life feels game over? What in your life feels like a cul-de-sac? What in your life feels completely hopeless? That's when the call of God shows up in your life. It is completely hopeless, and we are all barren unless the call of God shows up in our life. The call of God brings hope. The call of God brings, brings life. <clears throat> Abram, he wasn't qualified for any of this. I wasn't qualified for any of this. You're not qualified for any of this. Some of you might have heard an announcement to go serve with students. You're like, I am the last person you'd ever find working with students. That might be just the person we want. If there are two people who come to me and one says, hey, I've been serving in this ministry 20 years. Here's my resume. I've, I know some things, and I've, I've done some pretty amazing work. And someone else says, I don't, I don't know if you want me. I don't think I'm the right person for this. You know who I'm choosing? The humble one. What's the call upon your life? The call of God on our lives is, is a picture of grace. Abram was qualified because of grace. You might have heard it said before, God doesn't call the qualified. He, he qualifies the called. And your first step is to go. Get up and you, you go. Now let's talk about barrenness. I mentioned it earlier. The condition of man's sin spiritually we're all barren 
Spiritually, there's no life in the future. You and I cannot birth new life unless God calls. And there's a common theme in the first 12 chapters of Genesis. When God speaks, there's new life over the void and the darkness. Can there be life and salvation and redemption? Abraham stood alone in this, and he went. And some of you, that's what's being asked of you, to take a stand. What made Abraham great is the call of God. What makes your life great is not you. I know it's popping some bub bubbles here today. What makes you great is not you. What makes you great is the call of God in your life and your response to it. God defines that. As I was sitting studying this week, I was overwhelmed by the fact that I couldn't speak in high school. I went to speech therapy when I was a kid. I stuttered and mumbled all over the place. My parents were always like, what? And my brother would interpret it because he was as bad as I was. <laughs> but in speech class, when it was my time to give a speech, I'd rather take a zero. I remember several times I walked right by the classroom. I couldn't do it. I wore glasses. My glasses, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this, would fog up because there was so much heat <laughs> radiating from my face that my glasses fogged up. So when I gave a speech, I couldn't see the people out there, right? So it was either I take the glasses off, now I don't, I'm tripping over stuff. I played in band, and it was time to tune our instruments with a 100-person band. Everybody's looking at me as I'm tuning my trumpet. And my hands were shaking, and the note was shaking. I was not qualified for God to call me. And I'm overwhelmed by his call in my life. And the same can be true for you. He's just asking you to get up and go. You don't need all the answers. Think of Abraham's life. He was asked to sacrifice his son that he eventually got. Go up the mountain and sacrifice your son. He's like, what? What do you want me to do? God's like, just keep hiking. Just go up the mountain. Let God worry about the details as you go. We live in such a planned culture that we feel like we have to have everything figured out, every detail, I dotted, T crossed. Trust God with the details. When he comes, say yes and go. Say yes and go. Now, for some of us, we've been following Jesus, and there's something he's been asking you to do, and you haven't gone. But God is gracious, and he is patient. He's waiting for you to respond to the call. For some of us, we've never received the call of to be saved. Like God sees you, and he's been calling to you. And he's asking you to deny yourself. To, to say yes to Jesus means I am surrendering everything. It's no longer my life. It's not about my comfort. It's not about my dreams. It's not about my goals in life. It is not about my bank account. It's not about what's passed on to me. It's about God's call in your life to receive that, to say yes to Jesus. That's grace. God loves you as you are today, not where you want to be in the future. God loves you where you are today. He sees you. He loves you. And he's calling to you. Leave your country. He was going to let go of all of his economic security, his material security, his physical security, his social security. I don't know if they had that back then. He was leaving the people. Leave your familiar for the foreigner, for the foreign. He would always be an outsider from this day forward. The rest of his life, 175, I believe, the rest of his life, he's an outsider. Why? Because you responded to the call of God in his life. Let go of the personal. Let go of the emotional security. Don't rest in your family. 
Don't rest in that relationship. Don't find your self-worth and your significance. Find it in God and God alone. In, that is our security. That is the only thing that is secure. If God said to go, go. Uh, when I was in college, I did some marine work. I worked on waterways. Paid my way through college by working on towboats and barges and tugboats. And when you get out into the ocean, ocean vessels have barnacles that attach themselves to the bottom of boats and large ships. And they can slow down the vessel by up to 60% of more fuel being spent because of the barnacles and the weight as they attach. And when a yacht is in harbor, it takes hours and hours and sometimes days to go down there and chisel the barnacles off. Some of us, we're in the harbor. There's these barnacles stuck to us, holding you back. And I have found personally, I don't know about you, the longer I delay in following Jesus and the call that he's asking me to make, to respond to, the more complicated it gets, the more excuses. Well, it would have been easier two years ago, but now I have this and I have this commitment and I have that and I'm doing this. And the longer we delay, the more complicated it gets. What are the barnacles that are holding you back? They secure a fast curing cement that's among the most powerful natural glues known to mankind. They're actually trying to replicate the glue of these barnacles in commercial re retail. Abram got up and went. He got up and he went. The second most discussed person in the, the New Testament from the Old Testament is Abraham. Moses is discussed the most and then Abraham shortly after. This is what Paul says about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest upon grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring that only to the adherents of the law but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham is the father of three world religions, over half the people on the planet, Muslims, Christians, two billion Muslims, approximately two billion Christians, a couple hundred million Jews consider Abraham as the father. He's the father of us all. It's written, I have made your father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead. And calls into existence the things that do not exist. Listen, in hope, in hope, Abraham, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. It's not faith if you have it all figured out and you know all the answers. That's not faith. Faith is taking a step when you don't know. There's unknown, there's uncertainty, there's risk, there's cost. When was the last step of faith that you took? For some of us in the room, it's been way too long. And God's patiently waiting for you to take that step. So that, not that you can be blessed, so that the people around you can be a blessing. Because of your generosity this week, there were some extra, extra school supplies left over. Thank you. I'm sitting in my office. I got these school supplies. And there's a school half a mile away. Zaharis. I may be saying that wrong. Zaharis Elementary. It's right around the corner. So I, I've never been to the school, never been in there. So I knock on the door, and they let me in. And I drop off school supplies, and there's six teacher, staff, that they're all there. I'm like, oh, that's so gracious. Thank you. And where are you from? Boulder Mountain. Oh, is that where they do live nativity? <laughs> I emailed the principal the next day. Hey, we'd love to just bring over some coffee and bagels for the staff. We're for you. Thank you for what you do. You probably don't hear this very often, 
If there's anything we can do, if you have a kid in need in your classroom, call us up. We'll meet that need. Blessed to be a blessing. I want the schools in our neighborhood to know this church exists, not for our benefit, for their benefit. I want this community to know we're here, not for our benefit, for their benefit. Live nativity is going to happen, not so we can look good, and woohoo, we had a lot of people, so that they might meet Jesus. That's why we want to have live nativity. We want to be blessed to be a blessing. You're a part of that. This church, when God calls, let's answer it. Some big things he's calling us to do. Let's, let's go. Who's on board? Let's, let's go. Yeah, you're like, oh, what about this, this, and this? I don't know. God's called us to reach the neighborhood and reach the community for Jesus. I don't know how we're going to do it. I know we're... I know we're going to be here. I don't know how we're going to get there. We'll figure that out as we go. Abraham eventually figured it out. He didn't have all the answers. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the call that you've placed on our life. For some of us, we think of that first call into relationship with you. We're overwhelmed by it. Many of us in the room, we didn't have any other response but to drop to our knees and declare you good and say yes to you. And then there's been all these other calls that you've had in our life over the years. Some we've said yes to, some we've delayed, some we've responded to, some we've just said flat out no. And yet here you are, graciously waiting us, waiting for us and waiting a response from us. And I pray that we would do business with you today that we would say yes to whatever you're asking us, even before you ask. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those Father, who are not here in the room. We recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do. And then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.